to be able to answer any questions. So without any further ado, let's uh, talk to Dr. Mwedi now. She'll tell us about the importance of having Africa involved in the COVID-19 vaccine development. Dr. Mwedi, it's over to you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. And thank you very much for joining us today. I'm very pleased to be joined by Professor Zmadi of the Vince University and uh, Kalibu of the Uganda Virus Research Institute to discuss COVID-19 vaccine trials and vaccine development and approval in Africa. As to the situation, yesterday, the African continent passed the 500,000 reported COVID-19 cases mark. We are now in a phase where many governments are easing the physical distancing and lockdown measures. And we are seeing as a result, an increase in cases, including in South Africa, in Algeria, in Cote d'Ivoire and other countries. And this is what is happening as well globally. So it's more important now than ever that the public health and prevention measures be scaled up and that the response is done in differentiated ways based on what is happening locally. And of course, the involvement of people in all this is absolutely important. We can expect this virus to continue circulating until a vaccine is made available to people in the world and to people in Africa. There are nearly 150 COVID-19 vaccine candidates, including 19 in clinical trials. And I commend South Africa for participating in the first COVID-19 vaccine trial in the WHO African region. We'd also very much like to encourage other member states to join the vaccine trials. And I'm sure we'll be hearing, we'll be hearing more about the vaccine trial in South Africa from Professor Madi. We know that vaccines are very important for public health, including for the COVID-19. When we have an effective COVID-19 vaccine, it will make sure that it takes into account if countries have participated, the immune response of populations in Africa. We know also that when we have a vaccine, it'll need to be rolled out at an unprecedented speed and scale. Equity must be a central focus of our efforts. And too often African countries have ended up at the back of the queue for new technologies, including vaccines. These life-saving products must be made available to everyone, not only those who can afford to pay. We've seen movement around this with leadership by the African heads of state, facilitated by the African Union and the launch of the Consortium for COVID-19 Vaccine Clinical Trials. Globally, Gavi, has launched the COVID-19 Vaccines Global Access or COVAX facility for cooperative investment, shared risk, pooled procurement and equitable allocation. This facility is part of WHO's ACT Accelerator, which aims to speed up the development, production and equitable access to COVID-19 diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. And WHO's COVID-19 Technology Access Pool or CTAP which aims to make sure that everyone has access to the relevant intellectual property and know-how to enable equitable deployment of COVID-19 tools. We also see that even when vaccines are readily available, there are logistical and service delivery barriers to reach every community, which must be overcome. The regional coverage rate for routine immunization is 76%, which is far short of the 90% goal and this low coverage leads to frequent outbreak, outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases like measles in the African region. So countries can take steps now that will strengthen health systems, improve vaccine delivery, and pave the way for the introduction of a COVID-19 vaccine. These include mobilizing financial resources, strengthening local vaccine manufacturing and regulatory supply and distribution systems, building workforce skills and knowledge, enhancing outreach services, and listening to community concerns to counter misinformation. This is very important. A successful COVID-19 vaccine will be a global public good. To ensure that it reaches everyone in need will require strong health systems and global solidarity. I very much look forward to our discussion today and thank you again for having joined us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mwedi. And uh, as you say, given the fact that Africa 
is uh, host to one of the most unequal societies. Uh, this is uh, very important, the issue of equity. Let's now go over now to Professor Shabir Madi, as we mentioned that uh, Professor Madi is leading Africa's first COVID-19 vaccine trial, the Oxford trial. It started recently in South Africa. So Professor, can you just tell us a little bit more about the research? Uh, who and what is being considered when choosing the participants? So good afternoon to you and thank you for allowing me to participate. So the study that we are undertaking, as you mentioned, is a vaccine candidate that was developed at the Jenner Institute uh, in the University of Oxford. And just to clarify that uh, there was actually absolutely no interest on the part of the University of Oxford to search out South Africa to do a vaccine study. In fact, it was South Africans that approached the University of Oxford uh, to determine whether they would be willing to include uh, South Africa as part of the clinical development plan. And the actual funding of the study also is not coming from the University of Oxford, uh, but rather from the South African Medical Research Council and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So in terms of where we are right now, we started enrolling into the study uh, just over two weeks ago, uh, and there have been certain, certain uh, challenges that we have been experienced. The plan is to enroll 2,000 participants over a period of four to six weeks, and then the plan is to follow them up, up to about 12 months. But uh, the timing in terms of when we would get the result as to whether the vaccine potentially works or not is probably going to be sooner. And the reason for that is because of the really high rate of transmission that is currently occurring in South Africa. So we would be able to determine whether or not the vaccine works when we got up to about 42 cases of COVID-19 that has occurred in participants. Uh, and we anticipate that would likely occur as soon as November or December of this year. Previously, we had projected it might only occur in June of next year. The participants are individuals between the age of 18 and 65 years without any underlying serious medical condition. People with hypertension, diabetes are allowed to participate in the study provided they actually uh, get diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, is well controlled. It's mainly looking at individuals without HIV. There's a small component of the study that does address the issue of safety and the immunogenicity of the vaccine in people living with HIV. Uh, but we're not really addressing the issue of efficacy in the population with HIV. We're hoping that from the data that we establish, uh, from the evidence that we establish in people without HIV, the efficacy data coupled with the immunogenicity data it would allow us to make some imputations as how well this vaccine would work in people with HIV as well. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Madi. Uh, Professor Madi, very uh, interesting to note, as you say, that it was South Africa that actually sought out Oxford University and that the study is being spearheaded by the South African Medical Research Council, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So let's see what we can learn from Africa. Africa, obviously, having dealt with various viruses and uh, illnesses, uh, Professor Kalibo has been involved in vaccine development in Africa for many years, especially working on both uh, an HIV AIDS vaccine and the Ebola vaccine. So. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. What can you tell us about the common challenges, COVID-19 vaccine research and what you're faced with uh, other vaccines? What lessons can be learned? Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to uh, contribute in this press conference. I also thank and welcome Dr. Moeti and Professor Madi. Uh, I think all of us, as you have had, uh, this pandemic has come, although the, uh, the extent of the epidemic in Africa has not reached the same extent as in other places, but we need to be prepared. And we all believe that a vaccine will play a major role if we are really to manage uh, this uh, uh, outbreak. Before I go to the other experiences, uh, we are also preparing ourselves here in Uganda from the very top, from the government, from the president, encouraging us to participate in COVID uh, vaccine activities, uh, it, using two approaches, encouraging our scientists to come up with concepts, uh, to develop our own uh, vaccines. And the many institutions are really putting their heads together. Uh, and the government has uh, also 
uh, promised some funding so that we can come up with some concept, but also to look around for the best, uh, the good candidate vaccines to be tested uh, in our country. So we are open to this, uh, just like what South Africa has done. We are discussing with uh, uh, other uh, uh, developers uh, to test uh, COVID vaccine and hopefully now we're working on some uh, protocols. But going to other vaccines and the experience that we have had, we participated in the first HIV vaccine trial uh, in Africa, uh, in which we conducted in 1999. We have participated in other vaccine uh, trials of Ebola. Uh, now we are preparing one for Rift Valley fever. Uh, initially, there were a couple of challenges and these challenges are spread. <clears throat> There are political, uh, there are social challenges, there are legal challenges, there are ethical barriers, regulatory barriers, uh, media uh, issues in the communities. So there were a number of issues that we, we, we did face. But what I learned is that as long as you communicate well, you inform the public, you inform the communities, you address the issues, work together, uh, you, uh, you are likely to overcome some of these uh, challenges. Uh, we didn't have at that time very good ethical and regulatory uh, processes for vaccine trials, HIV vaccine trials, but we worked together with international communities. Yeah, WHO did help us quite a lot, uh, develop capacity, training, exchange of ideas, and we developed uh, working with international partners, good regulatory systems, uh, ethical uh, review systems, for our vaccine uh, studies. And eventually the first vaccine trial, it took us like three years uh, from the discussions to the initiation of the study. But the latest trials of vac HIV vaccines were a little bit more uh, straightforward because of the capacity we had built, the trust that we had built uh, and all the systems and working uh, together as a team. So even with this COVID, uh, as we prepare for vaccines, we are also preparing ourselves to communicate to the communities where we plan to conduct the studies, answer the questions. I think the communities will trust uh, scientists if they provide the right information. Institutions that have um, a track record and including the scientists that have a track record, being open, discussing with the regulatory quite early enough and ensuring that uh, the studies and all the, the work we do follow the highest international ethical and legal requirements. So there, there won't be any substandard. We will follow and we need to prepare ourselves for this, the highest international and ethical standards. And I'm sure that many African countries will be able to do this working with our partners. So in summary, the challenges were brought, addressing a number of issues, but they are not insurmountable. As long as you work together as a team, working with the scientists, working with the communities, uh, working with the re regulatory bodies and the international uh, community like WHO uh, and uh, um, now Africa CDC. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Professor Curley Woods. It's very important, as you say, to get the buy-in of the communities because uh, it is for the communities that these vaccines are being developed. Let's get uh, questions from my colleagues. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, please use the Q&A function in the app so that we are able to take your questions. We already have some questions that are coming in. By the way, when you uh, ask your question, please identify yourself, which organization you're representing, and then please point out to whom you would like to pose the question. As I mentioned that Dr. Mwedi is also joined by uh, Dr. Yaz, so he will be able to assist in answering some questions. So we've already got some questions. Let's go to those. We've got a question here uh, from the BBC. It's uh, from Rhoda Odiambo from BBC Africa. How many countries have the capacity to manufacture and full vaccines in the event that one becomes available? So this question goes to you, Dr. Mwede, and uh, Professor Madi, if you'd also like to weigh in, please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, thank you for that question. I, I think that the 
after having established the efficacy and safety of a vaccine, one of the most important issues under discussion now is to, at the global level, establish the capacity to produce the hundreds of millions of, of doses that will be needed to deal with uh, the current situation of a worldwide pandemic. Um, and so it's, it's an important question to see what could be Africa's contribution to this. We have several countries that are actually, that have institutions that are producing vaccines. Some are uh, public, uh, parastatal, and others are in the private sector in partnership with governments. For example, in Senegal, the Institute Pasteur has uh, vaccine production capacity, have been producing yellow fever vaccine for many years and is an important partner in WHO and then for to WHO. And there are several other um, North African countries that have vaccine uh, production capacity in Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria. I was on an, an official visit to Algeria a year or so ago and I visited one such institute. South Africa, of course, has such capacity. Egypt has uh, some capacity to, produce, to manufacture vaccines. And Ethiopia, I believe, is, is relaunching and reestablishing its, um, its capacity. So we do have some countries where vaccines can be produced. Clearly, there is need to mobilize the private sector to uh, improve the capacity to produce vaccines. It will be quite important in this case. So um, this following question is from Marceline uh, Nepal. She's from Fraternité Matan in Ivory Coast. So I'll give this question then to you, Professor Kalibu. It says, what is the reaction to the rumor that Africans are to be used as an experiment for COVID-19 vaccines? If it's actually also posed to the WHO, so um, you'll get an opportunity to respond as well, Dr. Mwiti. But in your experience, uh, Professor Kalibu, is that something that you can speak to, the possibility yeah, yeah. of this? Yeah, the, uh, the, the, those, um, it's good that, that is, they're calling it a rumor. Even when we did our first HIV vaccine trial, one of the challenges is why are we, used, are we being used as guinea pigs? Yeah, that concern is not surprising. People always at the start, they have those concerns and worries. Uh, that's why we need to have, to make sure we have processes to ensure that we follow the highest ethical legal standards. Uh, to have scientists of high caliber, institutions of stand that are going to participate, but we're also working with other scientists. If there are vaccines brought in from elsewhere, international, that have a track record, yeah, I'm sure everyone globally would like to do something that is scientific, ethical, and legal. So the processes we're talking about involving everyone will make sure that we're not just being used as guinea pigs, but what we're doing is to conduct studies, to try vaccines that have been developed using the highest scientific uh, um, standards, and also conduct the trial in the highest ethical and legal standards using our regulatory bodies, our ethical uh, re uh, re research uh, support uh, offices and the committees and all that, so that we avoid that. So far, in my experience in vaccines, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've participated in many uh, vaccine trials for HIV, about six of them, for Ebola, uh, for now Rift Valley. Uh, we have not seen uh, countries, at least in my country, where we have conducted uh, studies below international ethical and legal standards. And our volunteers, our real volunteers were explained about the studies and the consent to participate in the studies voluntarily. We give them informed consent, which they need to understand in their language. They are free to participate. They are free to withdraw at any time. Their insurance cover coverage. So. This is what we need to follow. And I'm sure the scientists that are going to conduct studies in Africa, the collaborators we're going to work with in Africa are going to follow the same as we have done in the past many years. So I want to assure our African brothers and sisters that we as scientists, we need to make sure, and we'll make sure that, that this happens. Of course, working with other partners, uh, the, the, the societies, the, pol the, the political leaders, our health experts to ensure that we provide the best uh, to our population. There's no advantage 
uh, on our part or anybody, even the vaccine developer, to use Africa as guinea pigs. We need to use the highest ethical standards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kalimu. Dr. Mwadu, would you like to speak to that? And this obviously has some history. There was the furore not so long ago around some French scientists and what they said. So mm -hmm. I think it, it does raise real concerns for people who don't know how vaccine mm -hmm. development and the process uh, is undertaken. Um, yes, I'll, I'll just be brief because I think uh, Professor Kalibu has answered so well, quite comprehensively, this matter. Um, I think what's very important is, is uh, to establish the principles by which African countries, scientists, and populations participate in vaccine trials and other trials as well, that to make sure that they are carried out to the highest international standards. I think Pontiano has said that extremely well. What we also want to be sure of is to make sure that populations understand this, that, that the, the systems are in place now in African countries, that those um, cautions are being taken, the regulatory bodies are being increasingly well developed and the, these principles are being respected in African countries. I think his experience that he has shared with us speaks for itself. So it's our responsibility to inform the African public so that we both reassure people that it will not be allowed and the governments are going to be imposing and the regulatory uh, authorities in countries are going to be imposing these international standards so that we encourage people and help them understand that taking part in these trials is to our advantage. It is extremely important that these tools be tried out in African populations so that we can understand how they interact with us and we can see how to benefit. And most importantly, one, one of the principles as well is that once people have participated in vaccines, Tri development trials, they have the right to have access to those tools. It is one of the, the, the ethical principles that, that will also, I think, be very important to, to emphasize to our populations. If I can just give the example of the advantage of this understanding dawning on people, the, the Ebola vaccine trials that were carried out in the, the, the DRC in the first, uh, in, in, in the Equator, um, trial in, in the Equator outbreak that happened in 2018. Uh, at that time, people were very reluctant, people were very fearful, and a great deal of work had to be done to persuade the population to, to, to be vaccinated. Now, our experience is proving to be quite different, that there was a, a very keen interest in the population to be vaccinated in, in the outbreak that uh, just started uh, some weeks ago. So informing people accurately, but ensuring that this information reflects the reality of the standards that are being applied is very important for encouraging vaccine research in Africa. Okay, apologies for that. So the, the question here is from Chris at CGTN. Professor Madi, it's uh, posed to you. It's about what is so special about this vaccine development with regards to COVID-19? And I think it's a valid one, considering that we are always saying there's so much that we don't know about COVID-19. So I'm not too sure I understand what's so special about it. So just uh, one of the earlier questions that you sort of pose is, or someone poses, what is the uh, manufacturing capacity in Africa? And I think when answering that, we need to understand that there's different technologies that are being deployed in terms of development of a COVID-19 vaccine. And some of the capacity that we do have on African continent doesn't necessarily lend itself to being able to develop any of the different vaccines that are being uh, currently developed. So there's no facility on African continent as an example to develop gene-based vaccines uh, and possibly even vector-based vaccines. In terms of the vaccine that we're evaluating, uh, right now we don't know what's, whether it's going to be the vaccine that works or one of few vaccines that's going to work or whether it's going to work at all. The evidence that we've got at hand to suggest that there is going to be possible protection with, against COVID-19 is based on the non-human primate uh, challenge studies that were done at the, by the University of Oxford, which shows that when taking macaque monkeys uh, after vaccinating them and challenging them, challenging them with the virus, you're able to reduce the severity of disease that occurs in those macaque monkeys. 
But obviously we can't extrapolate from non-human primates uh, in terms of how the vaccine will perform in humans. And that's the reason why we're doing it. What's so special about doing the study in, South, in Africa uh, really speaks to an earlier issue. And that is in the absence of gaining experience in a local context as to the safety as well as to the efficacy of the vaccine. The legacy of vaccines uh, in terms of inter its introduction into low middle income countries is many life-saving vaccines have lagged by between five to 20 years from the time when it becomes available in high income countries to the time when it becomes uh, available in low income countries. And some of the contributing factors to that lag includes cost of the vaccine and access. But another major uh, factor that contributes to this lag in terms of introducing life-saving vaccines onto the Af African cont continent is simply the absence of, of information. And we end up with sort of are trying to generate data in terms of the efficacy of the vaccine when the vaccines have been around already for five, 10 years. Uh, and that has really contributed to us not being adept in terms of introducing these vaccines at an early stage. So it's critical that we actually understand how these vaccines, and not just the Oxford vaccine, but many other vaccines work in African context. If anything, the criticism right now shouldn't be about possibly using Africans as guinea pigs. We need to understand that Less than two and a half percent of all clinical trials that are done globally are done in Africa, which constitutes 17 percent of the world population. If anything, there isn't enough clinical trials being done in Africa to understand how therapeutics, including vaccines, work on an African context, because there's very little financial incentive on a part of industry to actually conduct these sort of studies in Africa. So the, the entire discussion needs to be flipped on its head in that there isn't, in, in fact, enough studies being done in Africa to inform us as to how well these uh, therapeutics, including vaccines, would work in the local context. Okay, so just to uh, go back to that question, uh, Professor Madi, the question is, and I'll read it as it's written, it's about how you, what is unique about this vaccine compared to the rest being tested elsewhere? So I'm not sure if that helps you understand yeah. it any better. Sure. So this is, uh, like I said, there's four different sort of the uh, pla vaccine platforms or technologies that are being used to develop a vaccine. The one that the Oxford Group has employed is what, what is called a vector-based vaccine, a vector-based approach. Uh, it's uh, this particular candidate, it's a non-replicating vector vaccine. And basically what it means is that it's taking a virus in this particular instance, an adenovirus, which doesn't really cause uh, illness in humans, that has uh, been engineered, so it can't actually replicate once given. And it's inserted into that the genetic sequence of what is known as a spike protein. So when it's actually given, the body is able to use a genetic material that's been inserted into the virus to start producing the spike protein. And that basically allows the immune system to recognize it as being foreign and develop an immune response. Now, whether this is the ideal approach to take or whether the gene-based vaccines, as an example, the messenger RNA vaccines that are being developed in the US or the inactivated vaccines that are developing, being developed in China, we don't know which of those technologies are going to be best suited in terms of inducing the best immune response and providing the best protection. So right now it's completely unknown. So we can't say any one vaccine is better than another vaccine because we simply don't have that data at this point in time in humans. It is only through the conduct of these clinical trials that we would eventually be able to assess which of the vaccine candidates and which of the technologies provides us the best uh, result in terms of safety as well as in terms of protection. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Amadi. So I've got this uh, next question from Ejiro Omkoro, who is a from Wari Delta State in Nigeria. He says uh, that how, he wants to know, Dr. Mwiti, how significant is running clinical trials in individual countries in Africa? What will it hope to achieve and gaps that it will fill? Um, thank you for that question. I think the question has just been, in fact, answered by, by both uh, uh, Professor Madi and uh, Professor Pontiano. Uh, the, the importance and the significance of doing the trials in Africa is that it will be able to find out uh, with more precision about the, the efficacy and uh, whatever may be the risks of the, the, the technology, the product the, the, for African people, 
because I think we know that uh, people's makeup of d different ethnic groups might be slightly different. So it's important that this product have the opportunity to be tried out in African people. Then we can get the most relevant information about uh, how it behaves, its, its efficacy, the, the how how people with uh, from in Africa react to this product. That is why it's extremely important to to carry out clinical trials. I think it has been said extremely well by the two professors with African populations in African settings, so that we get the closest information to what then will be the use of the of the product of the of the vaccine in clinical settings in the future in African countries. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mutu. So what we're saying is that a widespread of data is important so that we have a better understanding. Professor Kalibu, uh, this question is from Nelly Swim Somi from Health E! News in South Africa. She says it's been many years since scientists started their search for the HIV vaccine and are still continuing the difficult journey. What makes you confident or optimistic that you'll find a COVID-19 vaccine in a shorter space of time. And this is something you addressed earlier on about how it got easier, the HIV vaccine trial from the first one. So what are your thoughts on this one? Why do you think it'll be quicker and better? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, nobody has 100% confidence, uh, even with uh, uh, COVID, that this is the time we'll get have the vaccine. But based on the virology, the viruses we're dealing with, based on the immune responses that we are seeing, based on similar other viruses, there's some more confidence that it will be easier to have an HIV, uh, a vaccine for COVID than HIV. HIV is very complicated. Many people, first of all, we, we, let's look at nature. Many people, when they get HIV, very few people recover. Yeah? Very few people recover. People go down with the disease and they die. Even the immune system, natural immune system, is not possible to eradicate the virus. But in COVID, we are aware that many people do get infected and they do recover. And a lot of the recovery is because of the immune system that the individuals develop. Yeah? There's no treatment for COVID. People, some people are symptomatic. A few people get, of course, severe disease and die. The majority of people recover. And the recovery is mostly the immune system. And what vaccine developers do is to try to mimic nature. For HIV, it's been very difficult because nature has not succeeded. So there's nothing really to mimic. So in HIV vaccine, we are trying up to now to understand what is the protective immune response. For COVID, because people do recover, it may be easier to correlate recovery with the immune system, and then you design your vaccine to mimic nature. Yeah? Then the other is the diversity of HIV. HIV mutates so much. And like COVID, many of us in our labs, we have already sequenced the COVID virus. The virus we have sequenced and we have published our sequences just recently. In, uh, it's not, the virus is not so different from what we see elsewhere. So that's another uh, hope that a vaccine for COVID will be easier than a vaccine for HIV. The viruses are different, diff different. immune responses are different. But what we are seeing already in nature and in the virus makes us think that a COVID vaccine will be easier to have. But of course, we need to test it. That's why we need to do trials. We are already concerned that in a few individuals who have been infected with COVID, they lose their antibodies quickly. The, 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 the disease has not been with us for a long time, now it's six months, seven months. We are all looking in our patients to see how long the immune system, the antibodies and the T cells remain. We hope they remain longer. That's one of the few challenges we have. How long does the immune response uh, develop? But based on that, there's more hope that we can have a vaccine for COVID uh, as uh, opposed to the HIV vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Let's take this next question to Professor Mahdi. And I know you've actually answered it pretty much in the beginning, but you mentioned uh, something earlier on, Professor Madi, about the exclusion of individuals with HIV and how you need to better understand how they would interact with it. So, uh, it, and I'm going to link it to this question because as I say, I know you've answered it before, but perhaps it's something that you'd like to add. It's a question from Pamela Kumba from 
SABC Channel Africa. How do you actually select the participants? Is it based on voluntary or participants of being used as guinea pigs? As I, so I said, the question was answered, but perhaps you could just take on from what Professor uh, Kungo has just said about HIV, and you can take it from there about the individuals in this trial and what more you can add to that. So just to clarify, people with HIV not, are not completely excluded from the study, but rather we are sort of evaluating them as a small subset. And eventually we'll be able to, based on the immune response, make some sort of extrapolation as to whether the vaccine would confer protection by doing some sort of bridging analysis between the group without HIV, uh, in whom we're looking at both immune responses as well as the efficacy of the vaccine. So people with HIV are not completely excluded in terms of the clinical development pathway. Uh, in terms of the volunteers, to be clear, we did not go out knocking on doors, uh, asking people to come and volunteer for the study. All that we do is we make it known in the communities where we operate that the study is underway and volunteers come to the clinic uh, on their own accord. Uh, to indicate whether they're interested in participating or not. When they do come to the clinic, it doesn't mean they automatically get onto the study. In fact, we go to a very stringent process in terms of informing them what the study is, including what the expectations are of the individual that wants to participate in the study. It's more than just agreeing to participate in the study, uh, receive a vaccine, and for you never to be seen again. In fact, Participation on the study is quite erroneous in that what happens is that individual would need to have up to about between eight to 12 visits over a 12 month period when they are actually needed to come to the site to for a certain sort of uh, evaluation to be done. In addition to which, uh, when those individuals might develop symptoms suggestive of COVID-19, they would again need to make repeat visits to the site or site staff might need to go to their homes to investigate whether they got COVID-19 or not. So for someone to come onto the study uh, requires for them to understand what the study is about uh, before they get onto the study, before they are randomized to one of the two arms, either a placebo arm or the vaccine, they actually undergo a, a questionnaire. So there's an assessment in terms of the understanding of the study and they need to score more than 80% on that evaluation for them to be eligible to be a participant in the study. Uh, they go to an intensive process in terms of what the study is about, what are the risks uh, in terms of participation as well as what are the expectations of them. So we are not going out, knocking on doors, uh, forcing people to come and participate in the study. This is being done completely on a voluntary basis. The units where we did the studies are being done in South Africa. As an example, in my own research unit, we've been doing clinical trials on vaccines for over 25 years. Uh, in the past, we enrolled 40,000 children in the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, uh, which has subsequently been shown to be a major life-saving vaccine in terms of reducing deaths in children under age of five. In the past, we were the first unit on African continent to have evaluated the rotavirus vaccine, which prevents children from dying from viral disease. So this is not something that we're jumping onto a, band, uh, a bandwagon in terms of trying to do some work on COVID-19 in isolation. This is part of a legacy of the research that we've done in South Africa, which has really informed policy not just in South Africa, but at the World Health Organization in terms of the introduction of life-saving vaccines into public immunization program. So at the end of the day, it's not a matter of uh, being using uh, people from South Africa or the African continent as guinea pigs. If anything, if we do not do the studies on the African continent, like I said before, effectively what that means is that the introduction and the access to these vaccines is going to be delayed probably up to the time after the pandemic has passed, and that's when the vaccine will become available. If these sort of studies are not done right at the fore in terms of the, terms of, in terms of the clinical development of these vaccines. Thank you, Professor Madi. So, Dr. Murti, this next question comes to you. It's from Kara Ann, who is with AP. So she writes, one of our medical writers this week interviewed Gavi CEO Seth Berkeley, and he dismissed the idea of a people's vaccine saying that it makes no sense and vaccine makers would just walk away. Do you think that Gavi should be pushing harder on intellectual property issues and insisting on suspending patents? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, first of all, just to say that, um, of course, the, there is in Africa, as well as globally, a very strong wish among the population, among political leaders, 
for equitable access to the vaccine and, and various discussions are going on about how, what is the best way to, to facilitate this. Uh, and then secondly, Gavi is a WHO, a key WHO partner in supporting the work to develop effective vaccines and make it most importantly, supporting equitable access to these vaccines. Uh, as you probably know, WHO, working with Gavi and others, launched the Access to COVID-19 tools or the ACT Accelerator to accelerate the development, production and equitable access to, to vaccines. And these, uh, these were discussions where governments are involved, um, the private sector is involved, global health organizations, civil society, and several approaches are being considered, one of which is being very strongly promoted by, by some groups to, to make the patent information publicly available so that the, the vaccines can be produced by those who are able to, to produce. Other approaches involve what is more familiar to make sure that those countries that are the poorest and people, the, the poor people living in perhaps um, wealthier countries, particularly lower and middle income countries, have access to the vaccines at prices that are, uh, that are affordable. And that there is, uh, if you like, uh, pricing for different contexts with Gavi working to to create, if you like, the economies of scale by buying very large quantities and therefore being able to negotiate um, affordable prices for the poorest countries. So these are some of the discussions that are going on. There is certainly a dialogue still ongoing about the issue of uh, patents. And I think what we can do is to participate in this, in this, um, in this dialogue. Our main interest is to make sure that the private sector is interested in producing this vaccine, the quantities that are needed are available, and the pricing is such that low-income countries and low-income people are not disadvantaged and they're able to get access to the vaccine. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mujer. And colleagues, just a reminder that you need to please identify yourself as in the organization from which you are calling or representing, it's very important for us so that we are able to identify you. Okay, so this next question, Professor Madi, comes from Promet from Reuters. The question is, what are the next steps after results of the vaccines are obtained around November and December? If successful, when can we be brought into mass production? Professor okay, so in terms of the vaccine that's being evaluated currently in South Africa, uh, the University of Oxford has entered into an agreement with AstraZeneca in terms of being the eventual manufacturers of the vaccine and the owners of the IP. And AstraZeneca has also partnered with the Serum Institute of India for the SII to also have capacity to develop, uh, to manufacture the vaccine. In terms of when the vaccine would be available, uh, AstraZeneca is on record as saying that they would have commercial lots of the vaccine available as early as the beginning of next year. Uh, obviously, they're going out at risk at the moment in terms of setting up the facilities to manufacture a vaccine, which is unknown as to whether that vaccine would eventually be licensed or whether it would actually protect against COVID-19. So with regard to the timelines, I think it is possible that we would have a COVID-19 vaccine, at least a formulation that we're working on as early as the first quarter of next year, but it's completely dependent on the clinical trial results, not just the one study that's been done in South Africa. The same vaccine is currently under evaluation in the United Kingdom, where they're enrolling up to 10,000 participants. And I think they've already enrolled about 8,000 and the same uh, vaccine is being evaluated in Brazil where they, they're enrolling 5,000 participants. And the first study is planned in the United States, again, with the same vaccine candidate. So I think across these studies, we will likely get some sort of readout in terms of the whether the vaccine is safe as well as whether it protects against COVID-19. And uh, I don't know today, hopefully the vaccine would be commercially or would be available uh, for public use under emergency use uh, as early as the first quarter of next year. Uh, the big challenge that we face, uh, not just for this vaccine, but in general, in the field of COVID-19 vaccines, is we are looking, needing, requiring billions of doses of vaccine and not a few thousand or a few million doses of vaccine. And it's really going to be how uh, companies are supported in terms of being able to scale up production and at the same time, make it affordable and accessible to all countries, including low middle income countries, including two initiatives that have been led by Gavi, as well as SEPI. 
Thank you, Professor Mari. Professor Kalibu, this question is from Jackie Opara. She's a regional deputy editor for SciDev.net. The question is, judging by the history of vaccine development in Africa, what is the guarantee that an effective and affordable vaccine for COVID-19 will be developed in good time, putting in consideration the continuous spread of the vaccine in Africa? I think this is, uh, the question is related to an area on which uh, Dr. Moeti uh, nicely um, answered. Uh, all of us, we are uh, uh, concerned about access and access in good time. Uh, so when we talk about access, it has to be again, a team effort working together. The developers, uh, the, uh, the, the funders, uh, international uh, organizations like WHO, Gavi, uh, CEPI and others that are involved. So it's all coming together. But it's good to see that up by now, these discussions have started. Recently you had Bill Gates talking about if a vaccine becomes available, uh, the most vulnerable people, the elderly, uh, the minority population should be able to access it. Yeah? We have had discussion. Discussions have been held uh, by the European Union, uh, within WHO, uh, within even Africa CDC also, uh, here in Africa, discussing access. Having been in the HIV vaccine, similar discussions continued, and they continue up to now. But it's now a partnership. Uh, what Dr. Moeti talked about, uh, uh, the tier system in pricing, yeah? for the lower middle income countries, a different price, so that there's access. I think apart from commerce, many times we talk about commercialization, uh, but there's also the global, um, uh, the, the, the requirement uh, to do good by companies, by funders, by all organizations and governments. So I think working together, and you have to know, I think this is very, very important. We cannot, nobody is safe anywhere in the world unless all the countries are safe of this COVID-19. So if we want to stop COVID-19 globally, yeah, I think we need to stop the, uh, the, 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 the virus everywhere. So it's in most, everyone is interested that we develop a vaccine that will be accessible by the majority of people. There are of course unknowns, the speed. Uh, you have asked whether we can have a vaccine during this pandemic. There are many other factors that are beyond us. Uh, depending on who develops the vaccine, what is the capacity to develop many millions of doses that are required, the challenges that, that we're facing. But the good thing that discussions are going on involving many uh, uh, partners, the funders, the manufacturers, uh, the organizations that uh, have, have been always supporting Africa in terms of vaccines. So we're hopeful we shall continue with the discussion, continue with the dialogue, and I think it is international and global good that Africa has access to these vaccines. Thank you, Professor Kalibu. So we have nine minutes left for this briefing. Dr. Muti, this next question comes to you. Um, I suppose it wouldn't be a press briefing without an uncomfortable question. So here goes. This one is from Joe Obukata Ogodu. He is from Nigeria. He writes, why is Bill Gates highly involved in pushing for vaccines, which is proposed to start with Native Americans in Africa, when we Africans put together are the least affected by the pandemic, bearing in mind he has no medical background? What's your response to this? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, well, I won't speak for Mr. Gates, but I'll, I'll just reveal what I know of uh, the work of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with which we in WHO have worked uh, closely for quite a few years. I, I think, first of all, uh, the concerns, if you like, that, that, uh, that, that you are reflecting really are in line with the principles of the Gates Foundation and their emphasis on equity. So this is a foundation that is supporting health um, globally, education as well, I might say, that is very, very interested in ensuring that, you know, the poorest, most disadvantaged people are able to have access to the, the tools of science, the most effective 
uh, public health interventions, the same as everybody else. I think this very much underpins the work of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So it's not surprising to me that he would be particularly interested in ensuring that in a situation of this global pandemic, where we have seen when we look at other items, for example, access to testing kits, access to uh, pre personal protective equipment, that it is those countries that have the funding, that have the money to occupy the market that have really uh, taken, that have really competed successfully. And African countries, I might say, just referring briefly to testing, have struggled to have access to the testing supplies that have been needed. So. I, in addition to that, the, the, the Gates Foundation has been a very strong supporter of vaccines. They believe, as we do, in vaccine as a, a super public health tool to get the, most, the biggest results in terms of impact and saving lives. They've been involved in supporting the development of the meningitis vaccine, which was meningitis A vaccine, which was targeting meningitis in African countries. And that has made a huge difference. They are a key funder of Gavi, which is aiming at uh, ensuring access uh, and equity to the lowest income countries in the world. So in a sense, this interest it doesn't surprise me. It is very much in line with the principles of the Gates Foundation and the ge generosity of this foundation in ensuring that the most disadvantaged people don't suffer when it comes to access to technologies and the opportunity to improve their health. So it, this to me is very consistent with that and is, is very much appreciated. And just to say, I know that the, the foundation works with and through other partners as well. So it will be respecting all the principles that we talked about earlier when we we're making reference to the vaccine trials in African countries. So I've got a question and this I'll give to uh, Dr. Michelle Yao. So it's from Kenza Katla, Media 24, a Moroccan media outlet. The question, is how many vaccines are currently being studied globally and how many are being studied in Africa? I think, um, Dr. Mwedi, you did mention something about 19 candidates earlier on, but uh, uh, Dr. Yao, would you like to expand on this? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, globally, uh, there is uh, around 130 uh, globally, but uh, 19 um, among those who are maybe have uh, some promising a preliminary result and uh, under trial and uh, we have 19 uh, worldwide but um, in Africa we have only one in the one in South Africa uh, managed by uh, Professor uh, Madi. Uh, so what is uh, I think uh, the previous speakers have mentioned is very is essential that this trial take place also in Africa so that we can uh, be sure about the uh, efficacy, safety in the African uh, uh, context. So um, I think the discussion uh, within the social media about uh, Africa being the guinea uh, uh, pig um, is um, uh, maybe related to a specific context in the past. But uh, right now, I think there are many regulatory bodies in uh, Africa that uh, also ensure that uh, all this trial can be done uh, according to um, uh, scientific and ethical standards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yao. And finally, uh, Professor Madi, this question is for you. It's from Paige Muller from Times Live. She wants to know, should a vaccine be successfully developed, what will it be, or how will it, will it be made freely available to all what guarantee do we have that it will be made available to those with minimal means? And I think it's a very important question as well. Yeah. So I think uh, Dr. Moetti already addressed this issue. No vaccine is going to be made available freely to all because someone needs to eventually pay for it. Uh, it's how to actually develop a funding mechanism uh, which allows for access and equitable access across the globe. Uh, Convex, which is sort of the body that's uh, sort of the funding mechanism that's been developed, especially for low middle income countries, which has been coordinated by Gavi is, the, is sort of the platform through which vaccine will become accessible, hopefully, in low middle income countries. A country such as South Africa, which would need to self-fund it, would need to engage right now with that particular sort of initiative, Convex, to sort of upfront uh, put in a purchase order for them to be able to access vaccine for at least, at least 
for at least about 20% of the population as an example. So the onus is really on the part of governments. It's the onus is on the part of governments throughout the African continent to be proactive in terms of engaging with the various initiatives to ensure that when the vaccine becomes available, that they're actually able to access a vaccine. It's not a responsibility of industry. And I think if we expect it to be a responsible of industry, we will never get a vaccine onto the African continent. Okay. Um, so let's then just get a final round of comment from the panelists. I'll start with you, Professor Kalibu. So where we are now and where we're going. Again, I'll go back to the issue of there's so much that we don't know. What should we be mindful of in the development of a vaccine for COVID-19 going forward? Yeah, I think it's, you raised an important point. There are a lot of things we don't know, but uh, I think we are trying to use the best science uh, and the best minds uh, to make sure that uh, we move forward. Uh, it's good that we have started these discussions. Yeah, these discussions are important. Yeah. And it's good that countries like South Africa have started participating. We don't want to reach a time when vaccines are available, but they can't reach uh, where they are needed. Because of a number of these issues, the price, legal, uh, ethical issues, and all the worries about uh, uh, guinea pigs and, and all that. So it's very good that these discussions have started. Uh, and we should not be left behind. Uh, but we're also going to use the capacity we have already built uh, based on other vaccines that we have tested in Africa to ensure that we do test where we have opportunities, the vaccines in Africa, and quickly uh, have these discussions so that the vaccines become uh, accessible. So I'm very happy that these discussions are taking place, but we should know that these are, we call them the vaccine candidates. We don't have a vaccine. We are all looking forward to see how these vaccines will behave. Hopefully they will do well, uh, but we are not 100%. So I like these discussions and we should continue. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to get a quick final word as well uh, from you, Professor Madi. They say science is the study of consequences. So we want to be very deliberate about what we're doing. Earlier on, uh, Dr. Murti spoke about capacitating vaccine manufacturers in Africa. From what you have learned, what could we do to accelerate that and strengthen those frameworks? So I think it's going to be a tough ask of African uh, manufacturers and industry to basically start manufacturing vaccines when the reality is that except for a handful of vaccines, the rest of the vaccines that are used on the African continent are actually imported. Uh, even in South Africa, there's no manufacturing capacity in essence. Uh, despite a company such as BioVac having been in existence for 25 years, there's no vaccine they've brought to the market. Uh, and expecting a company which hasn't been able to do something over a 25-year period to do it over a 25-week period, I think it's being overly optimistic. So we need to be guarded in terms of what to expect in terms of manufacturing on the African continent. I would just like to end off by saying that although there's great excitement around vaccines, we need to understand that even with 19 vaccines going into human trials, will be highly successful if more than two of that 19 are eventually shown to be safe and efficacious. The legacy of vaccines is only 10% of vaccines that go into human trials that are eventually found to be efficacious and that become licensed for use. So there's still a long path ahead before we get a vaccine that is going to be available and at least a few vaccines that are going to be available against COVID-19. In the meantime, the focus can't be around vaccines. In the meantime, the focus need remains trying to slow the rate of transmission of this virus by adherence to those non-pharmaceutical interventions, the wearing of face masks, the physical distancing, the avoiding of overcrowded spaces. That is the current and immediate term uh, focus. It's not about vaccine. The vaccine development needs to take place, but we need to manage what is upon us right now. And that is the surge in cases that we're seeing across the African continent. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Professor Madi. So, uh, Dr. Yao, would you like to briefly say something in closing before we end with you, Dr. Moiti? Uh, what I'd like to say is that um, uh, in line of uh, what uh, Professor uh, Kalibu mentioned, countries need to do some preparatory work also in advance uh, because we noticed that uh, 
when the, we, we had the uh, experimental vaccine for Ebola, uh, in some countries it took time uh, at least to get them in when uh, uh, we had cases. So there are preliminary work that they need to be done and WHO is ready to uh, provide the technical support that is required to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Muti will end with you a final word. And I think a lot is on the mind on what happens after vaccine. Is that going to be the end? Mm. Um, no, I, I, I think what, what I can say, it's been, very, it's been said very well by my colleagues, uh, particularly the, the need to continue with the public health interventions and the need to prepare for the rollout of a vaccine when, when it becomes available. So we need to be doing some of the preparation now already. I just like to end by making, uh, saying a word about the involvement of people and communicating with people. So both about the public health interventions to stop the spike in cases after the, the easing of the lockdowns, it is people who are going to make the difference and they need to understand. Uh, I need to know that it's in my interest and in the interest of my family to take, take on certain very difficult actions. And I think whatever can be done to inform people, to uh, clarify their misunderstandings, both about the physical distancing and about a vaccine. It is very important that we invest in this and in WHO we're very committed to helping governments, working with our partners to make people understand their own role and to enable and empower them to play this role. It's absolutely central to everything that governments and, and international organizations will be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And colleagues, thanks to you as well for joining us. I know that there were lots of questions there in the Q&A uh, function. Unfortunately, we would like to get through as many as possible, but, but it's unfortunately impossible to get through all of them. So I hope that you do appreciate that. But let me thank our esteemed panelists, Dr. Matsidi Somwedi, WHO Regional Director for Africa. She is in Congo Brazzaville in South Africa, Professor Shabir Madi of Wits University, Principal Investigator of the Oxford COVID-19 vaccine trial in South Africa, but as he mentioned, it's really being led from South Africa by the Medical Research Council. Professor Pontiano Kalibu, who's director of the Uganda Virus Research Institute and director of MRC and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Uganda unit. He was joining us from Kampala, Uganda. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, APO, our partners in facilitating this online briefing Thanks to all of you. Have a great day further. That's it from us. Thank you. <laughs>